1-919-WDET-FM. I'm Tia Graham. A little later on the show, we're going to chat with the Detroit documenters about tow rates in the city of Detroit and a recent public meeting. However, this week, we got news that overdose deaths across the United States are down. And that's great, but it's also after overdose deaths have been skyrocketing over the last two decades. One big source of those deaths have come from opioids. That's why this month, the city of Detroit's fire department announced it will begin teaming up with Face Addiction Now to stabilize people experiencing an overdose. To discuss this now, we have two people leading the charge of this program. Detroit Fire Commissioner Chuck Sims is here alongside the fire department's medical director, Dr. Robert Dunn. Dr. Dunn, Commissioner Sims, welcome back to the Metro. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Of course. So, Commissioner Sims, starting with you, we know that overdose deaths have been down. They've been going down steadily, but in general, they remain relatively high. We do see the numbers trending down, but there's still a lot of people that need uh, support. So, talk about why there's a need for these quick response teams. Uh, Thank you for having us again. So, you know, last year we sent out uh, our first responders and they administered over 2,400 cans of Narcan last year, which is extremely high. So partnering with FAN is, is a great opportunity to, to help decrease some of those overdoses. And we're excited about it. Um, the way it's going to work is that we're going to respond to the scene. We're going to administer the Narcan. And once we stabilize the patient, we're, we will give them information, letting them know that FAN will be out. A, a quick response team will be out to give them treatment or um, give them resources, either at their home or at the hospital. So it's, it's, it's an awesome um, partnership. And I'm really excited to see the results. And if you could just go a little bit into FAN, uh, Face Addiction Now, the nonprofit. Um, um, if you can go into it, Commissioner Sims, or if you can go into it, Dr. Dunn, uh, just give us a little bit of a background on the nonprofit and the role that the fire department will play along with this partnership. So, Dr. Dunn? Yeah, so Face Addiction Now started back in 2007, really working with people in communities around Metro Detroit, particularly on diverting people who had been arrested or were in the criminal justice system, you know, for what's really a disease, right? Mm -hmm. And getting people into appropriate treatment and follow up. And a big part of that was developing peer recovery coaches, people that had had experience with addiction and recovery who are choosing to work in that space to help others. And that that's a vital part of this process. You mentioned overdose deaths have stabilized and started to go down. And a lot of that's because there are a ton of organizations in the community. We're working with Face Addiction now on this project, but there are other organizations we work with all the time on things like community naloxone training. The more you're doing in your community, the more effect you have on those deaths. And Dr. Dunn, just staying with you for a moment, because um, we were talking a little bit earlier, but just having a person in 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 um, service with you all, in partnership with you all, a peer support specialist who's been who've been in a position who've maybe even helped someone who's been in an overdose before, maybe they've experienced it themselves. In what way does that add extra value to having a, a support when you're out there responding to these calls? Well, it gives people who have a lot of expertise. Our our, our firefighters. EMTs and paramedics have a lot of experience in saving your life and doing that initial care, but they also are our eyes and ears in the community. They recognize that we're seeing some of the same things over again, and it's not just our emergency response that's going to help that. Yes, that's going to save the person so they have a chance to talk to someone about recovery and the next steps, but we want to have that whole wraparound service because that's what it takes to be successful. And my last question before we jump back to to, uh, Commissioner Sims here, uh, Dr. Dunn, uh, you talked a little bit as well. You said the disease of it. And a lot of the times, a lot of we don't talk about addiction as a disease. So do you think the way that our society is beginning to view addiction has changed the way the way we view addiction in our society has changed? Do you think that's helped add more support on the street and more support out there now that we've more than we've ever seen? Do you think that's a little bit of it? Yeah, absolutely. And that's and that's been a very important shift in the way we talk about this. You know, many other parts of the world always looked at substance use disorders as a disease, Mm -hmm. no matter what the substance was. And we often looked in the U.S. at this as a criminal issue. And obviously that wasn't working. Right. I mean, we had the highest deaths per capita of any any 
country on earth. Uh, we did an experiment with prohibition. That didn't yeah. work either. Um, so we really need to treat this exactly as it is. It's a disease. It's a complex brain disease that patients need a whole bunch of different options to be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Sims, uh, you yourself have a personal story of loss related to overdose death, and I wonder if you feel comfortable sharing it. Sure. So I, um, my brother, he experienced, oh, um, yeah, thank you. My brother, he was a, and I won't say he was an addict, but he did use drugs. Mm -hmm. And those drugs brought on the onset of mental illness. And so for probably, the, uh, I would say 30 years, he was a schizophrenic and I was his uh, caregiver. And just to see what, how devastating that was to our family, um, this, this uh, partnership is very sensitive to me and I'm really excited for it. And I know other people out there, other family members of those who have family members who are on drugs, they're excited to see this program as well. A lot of times, of course, before when we would get on the scene and administer Narcan, that's when our services would stop. And we have so many first responders who are asking, hey, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened here. And now it can give us a sense of comfort to know that we have these quick response teams to assist these patients. And just staying on, you know, along with that, we talk about the family. We were talking about the family a little bit before the interview. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a lot of the times, family members don't know how to really handle the situation. They don't know how to approach their loved one. Maybe they don't know if they give too much love or not enough love or tough love or do I do this or do I do that? What, you know, what should I do? So with your personal experience working with your brother and, 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 and um, helping your brother, what advice would you give to family members and, and people who are around their loved one uh, seeing things happening and they just don't know what to do? What, what's your advice? You know, the one advice I would say is just to continue to love them um, and love them as a family member and just realize that they're in that situation, not because of choice, I believe, but because of just things that happen and, and that they couldn't control. And so I think just taking care of my brother for approximately 20 years, uh, I just always made sure that he knew I loved him and I cared for him. And uh, his best interest was, was my main focus. Yes, yes. Um, my personal story as well. I have a family member as well. And I think we all just the biggest thing to do is to love, just to continue to love, support, just be as open armed, open, open armed and open minded as you possibly can with with your loved one. So thank you so much for that, Commissioner Sims. And just continuing on with the conversation, technically, it's still illegal to consume certain drugs like heroin or, and quick response teams are an attempt by public agencies to be less punitive to people who have used these drugs. Is this a shift that we're seeing government services be a little bit more open in a different ways to helping people get back on their feet versus being punitive? Well, I think one of the things is our, our medical responders have never been in that type of a punitive situation. But what we've really seen change is the attitude of law enforcement. Mm. Right. I mean, that that, you know, over the last decade or more, we have seen law enforcement officers embracing. Treating opioid overdose, carrying naloxone, getting people referred, you know, many people have heard about some of these programs like Hope Not Handcuffs, where yeah. and the new program the Michigan State Police has where someone who's experiencing addiction can go to any state police post and get linked to resources. So, you know, obviously there are some things I think that still need to change on the legislative side for that. But we have seen, again, from the people who are out there in the street, they know what was happening wasn't working. Yes, yes. And if you're just joining us, we're speaking with Detroit Fire Commissioner Chuck Sims and Medical Director Robert Dunn. We're discussing the creation of quick response teams in Detroit to help people experiencing an overdose. And Commissioner Sims, Face Addiction Now has been operating quick response teams across the state in places like Oakland and Macomb County. How has their work been slowing overdose deaths in the state? What have you guys seen and made you go, oh, I want to partner here? Uh, we can do with Dr. Dunn if that's more appropriate. Yeah. So what we've seen is that communities that implement these response teams, particularly for patients who have an overdose reversed and then refuse further care, they don't want to go to the hospital, maybe for a lot of good reasons, or they have some family support, often there's an opportunity right then to connect to services. And it's not a one-time thing. The whole point of these community response teams 
is to get out to where people are and to follow up with them in their homes or other places they're staying if they're experiencing homelessness so that there's someone who can coach them, provide that support, provide that that answer. Not everybody has a, a supportive family available and some people are, are far from their families. So the idea of using everything we can muster in the community to help people is a successful strategy in many parts of the country and what we've seen with some of our other community groups here in Detroit shows us that we have a, a really good opportunity with getting these resources out with our first responders. It's been really, really nice to see so many organizations who have the goal of supporting those who are uh, um, facing addiction, going through it, and really looking to uh, to get into recovery. So it's really nice to see all of these community groups coming together to kind of wrap around and find a way to figure this thing out. So as we continue to go on with this particular uh, uh, um, uh, partnership that you all are going to have, it begins Monday. So what are we going to see as it starts to roll out, what, what does Monday look like, especially for the fire departments across the city of Detroit? Yeah, Commissioner Sims? Yeah, so I th the program started on the 16th. Oh, on the 16th, I'm yes. so sorry, I looked yes. at that. So last so, Monday yeah, it started, yeah. thank you. So um, what they'll, they'll see, and, and you know, once we get on the scene and administer Narcan is stabilized, so we'll generate what we call a report, a case report. And once that report is generated, an automatic referral will go to FAN. And then that's when they'll disperse their quick response team. So everything is automated, which is really, really good. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to be there to comfort the family and, and the victim until the quick response teams arrive. So we're just really excited for it, um, for this program to, to work. And I know I know it's going to work because you have FAN and you have the Detroit Fire Department and you have two strong forces there. And just for the residents of the city of Detroit, ex you know, experiencing things that we've seen in the city, mental health calls, or maybe it's a call, whatever the call may be, there's fear there still wrapped around some of these calls. And even calling if you see a friend who's overdosed, you, you may be afraid to call. So what do you tell people in those situations when they have that lack of trust or the mistrust or just the, they're just scared and fearful to call authorities? What, what do you tell those folks? Well, I would tell them, well, first of all, you, you don't want the, the alternative to happen. Yep. Right. You don't want the person to die of yeah. the overdose. So don't be afraid to call um, the fire department. You know, we, we're not going to arrest anybody or anything like that. We're here to help people. And so um, and, and fan as well. So don't be afraid to call the fire department. Let us come out and treat you. That's what we're here for. We're here to service the citizens of Detroit. That is that's pretty much how we're going to leave it. Thank you so very much, both of you, for being here. Fire Commissioner Chuck Sims and Medical Director Dr. Robert Dunn. Thank you so much for chatting with us about the new quick response team that's out there with the city of Detroit Fire Department, making sure that they are approaching overdose in the most holistic way. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. The forecast today partly sunny, breezy, and warm, a high around 76 degrees. This weekend, Friday and or excuse me, Saturday and Sunday. Today is Friday. Highs in the low 70s with a slight chance of rain both days and Monday. Mostly cloudy with rain, a high around 71 degrees. Quick news hit the earth and the moon are getting some company this weekend a small asteroid will enter a temporary orbit around the planet on sunday nasa says the mini moon will orbit the earth for about two months but will not crash into it i need a telescope right now if you have one give me a call i will be on my way coming up wdet just celebrated a 10-year anniversary for one of our most beloved programs we'll go behind the scenes of the fan favorite show right after this it's the metro 
on 1019 WDETFM. I'm Tia Graham. Now, 10 years ago, an idea was hatched here at WDET, and it wasn't just me becoming an intern here. Curiosity is one of WDET's most treasured programs. It gives our journalists the space to investigate a lot of quirky and interesting things happening around Detroit and the Metro Detroit area. Recently, WDET's news director, Jerome Vaughn, sat down with a bunch of current and former WDET journalists, including Laura Herberg, Pat Batchelor, Dave Kim, and Amanda LeClaire, to explore how they help produce Curiosity. Welcome to a special episode of Curiosity, where we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the award-winning series. We're going to spend the next few minutes taking you behind the scenes and talking with some of the folks here at WDET who put the episodes together. I'm WDET News Director Jerome Vaughn. Curiosity is a monthly segment here on WDET that listeners have told us they love. The episodes are very Metro Detroit-centered, but perhaps the person responsible for producing Curiosity right now should tell you more about it. That's WDET reporter and anchor Amanda LeClaire. So Curiosity is a uh, listener-focused question podcast about Detroit. And what do I mean by question? Listeners, our listeners, write in or call in questions they have about Detroit, the metro area included, and they're just curious about things. As editor, producer, how do you start thinking about planning out an episode? So I look at the uh, list of questions that we have, and this list is constantly being updated. So we have a lot of questions to get to, and I look at what is one of the most interesting of the bunch that we've had. Each episode tackles a different question, and that means lots of research. In some cases, that requires examining hard-to-find county documents or researching Nike missile sites from the 1950s. Sometimes that means traveling beneath the streets of Detroit in city steam tunnels. And as Amanda often reminds me, it takes a lot of planning and effort to pull an episode together. It takes up a great deal of time and energy and specifically planning, really looking at how can we optimize what we're already doing, how can we feed it into the news cycle, how can we make this happen, and also keep up the the high level of creativity uh, and thoughtfulness that our former uh, podcast editor, Laura Herberg, really, really brought to light with the Curiosity series. I tracked down Laura Herberg to get her perspective on the series. She remembered some of the same types of challenges. It was hard to find um, the time to put into these stories while balancing uh, the day-to-day because curiosity actually takes a lot of work. You hear the pieces and they're so lighthearted and fun and so it seems like they're so easy, but these are little mysteries and they can take a lot of time and energy to tell and to tell well. Pat Batchelor has worked on many Curiosity episodes over the past 10 years. His most recent one answered a question about how the Detroit Lions chose Honolulu Blue for one of its team colors. Long story short, George Richards, the original owner of the Detroit Lions, came up with the name Honolulu Blue uh, after visiting Hawaii. Uh, he saw the hue of the ocean uh, on that trip, uh, and uh, he said, that's the color I want for my team, and uh, he called it Honolulu Blue. That may seem like a simple question to answer, but Pat spoke to football historians and checked in with the Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. He even contacted someone who had an audio recording of one of the team's original players from the 1930s. That player helped make the decision about the Lions' colors. And when it comes to storytelling, we're not in the 1930s anymore. We take full advantage of the digital world for curiosity. Dave Kim is WDET's digital manager. He also has a part in the process after the story has been reported, producing videos and photos for the series. He says he has a favorite when it comes to curiosity. One of my favorite curiosities is on Superman ice cream uh, by former WDET reporter Eli Newman. We literally went to an ice cream parlor. I uh, shot some footage of him talking about the history of Superman ice cream, 
scooping up Superman ice cream, literally taking an ice cream cone, putting a mite flag on it, and letting the ice cream melt, much to the chagrin of our ops manager. Sorry, Matt. And it, it, it did phenomenal on TikTok, on Reels. Superman ice cream. It's a Michigan favorite. But who came up with this iconic Midwest flavor? I'm Eli Newman, and in the latest episode of WDET's Curiosity, I find out the origins of Superman ice cream. No matter whether you're interested in who Lewis Cass was, or if you want to know about how the Boston Cooler got its start in Detroit, Curiosity will look into it. Pat Batchelor says there's one idea that keeps Curiosity moving forward. The fact that it's an opportunity for listeners to have an impact on what we do uh, and guide uh, our journalism, I think that's the best part of it. WDET released its first ever episode of Curiosity on September 19, 2014, when Terry Paris answered a question about why Highland Park and Hamtramck are surrounded by the city of Detroit. Since then, we've produced 70 episodes of the series, and more are in the works. But just remember, the future of Curiosity is in your hands. Send us your questions, and we'll try to find the answers. For Curiosity, I'm Jerome Vaughn, WDET News. That was WDET's news director, Jerome Vaughn, speaking with a range of WDET journalists about how they help create curiosity. And uh, I personally love curiosity. I'm not being biased because I work here and my, my co-workers often work on it. But my favorite one was about the Boston Cooler, the history of the Boston Cooler. Enoch, former WDET reporter Eli Newman did that. And it's one of my favorites. I go back to it often. And I love Boston Coolers. They are my favorite. Now, taking a quick look at sports. The Red Wings take on the Chicago Black Sox, Black Hawks <laughs> in preseason play tonight at LCA. That puck drop is set for 7 p.m. And just I'm giddy right now because the Detroit Tigers, they swept the Tampa Bay Rays yesterday with a 4-3 final score. The Tigers have now won five straight games and the magic number now is number one. Number one, the Tigers can clinch their first playoff berth at home in 10 years with a win tonight against the White Sox. So I'm super excited. I know what I'll be doing tonight at 640 when that first pitch goes through. Eat them up, Tigers. That's what we're doing. Coming up, we'll discuss what Lansing lawmakers are trying to do to increase funding for schools with Colin Jackson. You all stay right there. WDETFM. I'm Tia Graham, and we do have a segment coming up with our state reporter, Colin Jackson. Colin, you're on the mic right now, and we're actually talking a little bit before we get to the segment there about what's going on in Lansing, of course. But we are both Spartans. Yes, we are. We both yes, graduated we are. from Michigan State we University. We both spent some time at Spartan Stadium. Yes, I we have. Yes, we have. And we talked a little bit before we get started about just politics, sports, and Michigan State plays Ohio State this weekend, so we already know that's a loss. Yeah. I'm, I'm really hoping we get a little bit of that eat em up, eat em up. Rah, rah, rah. From the Tigers, right? <laughs> I don't think I'm it's hoping we get, I mean, from the Spartans too. I, I've never been an Ohio State fan, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out with a confession right now to you. I grew up a U of M fan, and <sighs> I went to door. State. State let me in. There's the U door. of M waitlisted me. U of M Office of Administration <laughs> have admissions. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yeah. I have a lot of love for my Spartan nation, my Spartan dogs out there all around the world. And I've just always hated Ohio State football. And I really, really hope they and lose. And I just want you to understand this, too, as well, Colin, you know, because, you, you know, you do radio, but you don't do it as live as often. This is going to come back for you. This might. Because it might come hey, for I you. I did sports radio for two years, <laughs> local sports radio. I'm ready for it. I'm used to the smoke. Oh. Okay, all right, you're ready, Jon Snow. All right. <laughs> so, also, U of M game this weekend. They're going to be playing Minnesota and Tim Walls. Is going to be in attendance. Tim Walls is planning on being there, though. So this is something that, um, as you see, we get closer to election season. Um, absentee ballots are now available in Michigan. So if you want to participate that way, you now have that option, and you can cast your ballot already through that absentee ballot system. But back to this football game, though. Yeah, U of M is playing Minnesota. Obviously, Tim Walls, governor of Minnesota. There's that collect. That's there's that connection there. Uh, he makes a big deal of this campaign about him being a high school football coach, winning that state championship <laughs> back in the day. 
coincidentally, uh, former President Donald Trump, the Republican nominee, he'll be in Alabama going to an Alabama football game on Saturday. So, I mean, the campaigns have no shortage of football connections here. Wow. Wow, I love that we could just bring that into this conversation really quickly and get right on back out of it because it's been busy. It's been busy, but it's starting it's to busy. slow down a little bit in Lansing, especially as we get closer to the election, which is in November. Uh, so break it down. What um, are we seeing right now in the state capitol? What was something that just passed? Yeah, so this week uh, was likely, at least from my predictions, one of the last days you may see lawmakers actually in action in Lansing yeah. uh, before ahead of the election. They have a lot of campaigning to do and whatnot and just preparations for the election. There are days on the calendar that they could meet if they need to, but yeah. I'm not expecting it. Um, but what they did see, one of the biggest things we saw was uh, passing this, edu- this supplemental education budget. So mm-hmm. basically, this is just another $126 million uh, going towards schools in Michigan. Wow. And what this is largely for, $125 million of that $126 million, will be going uh, toward per-pupil school safety and mental health grants. Um, mm-hmm. This is something that in previous budgets had upwards of $300 million allocated to them. So, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. so that's complete. That's a, that's, that's a half. A, it's a half percent cutback. That's a, that's a huge setback. So what were some of the thoughts there? I know you said that some of the Republicans were not re- necessarily happy with some of this. Right. So this kind of goes back down to during post 2020. You know, there was a lot of federal money going into the states for yeah. a lot of different things, a lot of different uh, purposes. And these uh, school safety, mental health grants were something that was supported um, in part in the budget the state budget as a whole was supported a lot with federal dollars Mm -hmm. that Democrats now control of the budget making process Mm -hmm. because they have control of the state house legislature, um, state house Senate and the governor's office. They're saying that this federal money is running out. Mm -hmm. So they had to make cuts here and there somewhere. So again, like in the 20 fiscal year, 2023, 2024 budget, that's the budget we're currently on that runs out next month before the state switches over to the FY25 budget for the finance nerds out there. Um, (laughs) I'm not one of them, so I apologize if I misspoke. (laughs) Uh, That being said, reporter math is a thing. But uh, so that originally when this budget passed, though, back in the spring um, or in the summer, this budget had, I believe, $25 million in ongoing funding that was allocated and uh, some extra money. So it wasn't a ton, and it was a significant cut to this. And this was outcried by Republicans. Uh, you heard reports that schools were not happy about this yeah. either. So this is something where um, the way Democrats are framing this is they kind of spent all summer trying to figure out how to draw blood from a turnip for less of a better way or for lack of a better term. And uh, they came up with this money from a separate fund that was also meant for kind of mental health support and staffing that schools hadn't used as much. So they're saying basically we can take that money and move it over here and spend this $125 million because that fund was going away. So we're just going to lapse that a little bit early. And now we have this 125 that can go on top of that other 25 that they already allocated for a total of around 150 million or so, a little bit more than that, uh, that can go toward these school uh, mental health and safety grants. But like you said, Republicans are very upset with this. They're furious. They're saying Democrats acted alone on this. They're saying that this is only half of what schools need. This is only for one year funding. So they're saying schools can't really plan that far ahead. You know, they're saying like if you're trying to hire a school resource officer or something like that, um, that's not something that schools can really do, according to Republicans. But you are seeing some support, at least from uh, school organizations in support of this bill passing. So, Kylan, do you believe that the uh, Republicans are serious about this or is this a ploy? Maybe do Republicans support the education funding or is this something that just seems divisive? I mean, it could be a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, you know, Mm -hmm. on one side, you know, like there was a lot of people, not just Republicans that were upset with how this was handled in the budget, Mm -hmm. you know, on the other side of things, um, there were a lot of votes against the school aid budget in the past years when this was uh, fully funded, you know, or fully funded in comparison to what it is right now. So and that's been also been pointed out by Democrats, you know, and they're saying, well, whatever Republicans are saying, that's not what I'm hearing from our schools, you know, and I'm not in those conversations. I'm not reading their correspondence be- between lawmakers and their schools, mainly because we can't. We don't have those open record laws here in Michigan, but that's a whole other thing. If you're just joining us, we're chatting with state reporter Colin Jackson about an education spending bill that passed Michigan's legislature. Uh, so, Colin, legislature, legislators are running for re-election, and that means they're out trying to get votes and also kind of playing it safe. So when they come back in January, what are the priorities? What are you seeing, especially uh, for Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Democrats, Republicans, the majority? What are you seeing right now? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things that are just kind of hanging out there that right now what you're seeing is, especially in these committees, lawmakers are trying to set up for for a future uh for possible like lame duck sprint in the period between the election and the new legislature taking over, depending yeah. on what happens. Um, some of those things, for example, the Senate Health Policy Committee yesterday, her testimony on bills that would expand uh, insurance coverage for birth control and contraceptives. Uh, that was something I wrote about yesterday. Um, those bills are still in committee and whether or not we're getting another committee hearing between now and the election remains to be seen. Uh, there's just priorities that are just kind of hanging out there that, um, never got fully across the finish line. Uh, data centers is one of them. This would kind of provide tax incentives or different um, incentives to draw these big data centers here. Yes. You know, think like those server farms. Like when you upload something to the cloud, that's got to be physically stored somewhere. So I was following your work and I <laughs> wanted to ask you about that because I said, wow, that's interesting. Something that most of us don't think about is how large data centers are, how much space they take up and how much power they take. So what is, what's going on with that? Yeah. So these are massive, massive uh, power drains. You know, these draw a lot of energy from the grid. Like you said, they take up a lot of energy, a lot of uh, space, a lot of energy. This is something that uh, and the legislature is pretty split on this, I'll be honest. In the House, you saw this come to fruition yesterday when there were two different votes on two different bills to support this. One of them passed after a long time. I don't have the exact minute count, but it was a while if anyone that watches the state House of Representatives in action. And, uh, and a lot of lawmakers just didn't vote. You know, they had to call names after they closed the board and they had to call names to get wow. people to actually vote for that. And then uh, they tried it again with another part of the package, a partner bill in it, and they didn't have the vote. So at some point they cleared the board. And I believe that happened twice. Wow. Um, so this is still something that's kind of hanging out there and more negotiations to be doing. Um, and one of the big things is environmental groups are upset with yeah. how this is playing out. Um, they're concerned about how this would affect uh, Michigan's clean energy standards and recent legislation passed to support Michigan's clean energy transition. Um, so and then you also heard concerns from lawmakers talking about uh, whether or not this would protect everyday utility users from seeing their own power bills go up to make up for the big power drain that these uh, data centers would be using. So, and again, you have a lot of Republican and a lot of Democratic support, but you also have a lot of Republican and a lot of Democratic opposition. So partisan issues aren't necessarily everything defining this legislature. And um, you just have been very, very busy lately. I've been following along with some of the work that you've been doing. And this is so many different questions I have. So the Make It in Michigan Fund would increase spending for public transit and for housing. How likely is it that this kind of thing would pass the legislature? There's going to be a lot of negotiations that need to happen to make sure this gets done. Um, this is something where this would be updating the state's major economic incentives programs, you know. And if you're opposed to this, which a lot of Republicans are at this current point, even if ones that have supported these types of business incentives in the past, they're saying that Michigan has... Every governor, every administration, Democrat and Republican, has tried some sort of business incentives program to make sure that we have uh, businesses coming to Michigan, relocating products here in Michigan. You know, and really what this directly is a follow up to 2021 legislation, if I'm not getting my dates wrong, uh, which created what's known as the SOAR Fund now. Yeah. And the strate that stands for Strategic Outreach and Attraction Fund. You know, we always love these big acronyms oh, yeah. in government. And <laughs> the SOAR Fund has been used to support kind of these like mega projects, you know. Think when Ford was supposed to build that battery plant in Marshall or... Okay. Uh, think about the Goshen uh, plant in uh, near near Big Rapids that you keep hearing about, yeah. you know. And these things originally passed with Republican support. These were Republican sponsor bills when they first passed. Um, but again, you know, that side of the aisle has soured on things, um, specifically uh, saying that there isn't enough oversight of these programs. Uh, meanwhile, you don't all you don't necessarily see the same support on the Democratic side of the aisle either. You know, this was something originally like this was bipartisan support, bipartisan opposition. Because on one side, you have people saying, we need to support these businesses so they can do business here in Michigan. And on the other side of it, you have the complaint saying, well, these businesses aren't doing anything to make life in Michigan more livable. So why are we giving a profitable multinational corporation like General Motors a billion dollars when we could be putting that money toward other things? So with the Make It in Michigan Fund, that was kind of an attempt to reshape that and reform that to create more kind of make these more holistic benefits, you know, where a business incentive package that goes toward a project would also put more toward, you know, like local transportation or yeah. whatever resources are needed. And you saw, again, kind of um, 
bipartisan support, bipartisan opposition. Not everyone was behind it. You know, there was a lot of this past the Senate last year uh, in the House. This has kind of been languishing where you see different lawmakers wanting different things. Um, Transportation has become a big part of it. Um, Earlier this year, kind of looping it back to the schools. Schools were a little bit upset with the plan saying like, hey, if you have this money, like we could use some help over here, you know. So uh, what happens to this? I don't think that this is the last we've seen it this legislative session, but from my read, it's going to take a lot more conversation to see something actually reach the governor's desk. Does the Make It Mission, Make It in Michigan uh, fund mark a sea change in lawmakers? Are, people are not as supportive of giving big corporation subsidies, no? I mean, you've... I think it's a consider a continuation. I don't necessarily know if this is a sea change. I think whatever does get through this legislature, especially if it does get through with any amount of decent level of bipartisanship, that could be a sea change, you know, because mm-hmm. right now, you know, you have a more progressive member of the state legislature, like a representative Dylan Magella or representative Devendorf, uh, when it kind of the previous package was announced or the most recent, I guess, public iteration of this deal was announced. They said they wouldn't support it without X, Y, or Z things. You know, yeah. a lot of that was kind of these um, community benefit and uh, things as well that I talked about. And the thing about that is Democrats need every single member to vote for this bill to mm-hmm. get it to the governor's desk. They can't sacrifice a single vote. If it ties, it dies. Wow. There's no tie-breaking Senate in the House. There's no tie-breaking vote in the House. So, you need either Democratic votes or you need Republican votes. Right now, Republicans, especially with the cultural flashpoint, with some of these projects that have received funding, having some sort of like varying degrees of ties to foreign companies, for example, in Goshen, um, being a U.S. subsidiary of a Chinese owned company, et cetera, that has become a very big cultural flashpoint. Um, and you've seen this uh, opposition just kind of grow as a result of that. So if you do get frame this in a way where Republicans, and Democrats can get on board with this, or you can even get progressive Democrats on board and some Republicans voting for this, I think that would be more notable versus just kind of another business incentive program that the state is aiming to create. I have one more question, but I do love talking to you because I get to learn so much. I feel like I'm a sponge right now soaking up everything that you're saying. But last question, I want to discuss auto insurance. Auto insurance is still extremely high, especially in Detroit. Is there any appetite for reforming that in the state? Are we seeing any movement whatsoever? We've seen a lot of legislation and a lot of political capital being expended behind the scenes, not necessarily in the goals of lowering auto insurance, but on the goals of the folks who have been catastrophically injured in auto car crashes who say because of the uh, the changes that they can't get the care that they need anymore. And that's something that it passed the Senate. It's been stalled in the House all year. Um, I haven't seen any signal that there's been appetite. Meanwhile, you see the catastrophically injured folks in the Capitol again whenever lawmakers meet trying to get this movement. Colin Jackson is a reporter with the Michigan Public Radio Network. Colin, as always, as always, as always, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. I learned so much. Thanks for having me. Of course. This is the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. Just had a great conversation with Colin Jackson. Taking a look at the forecast today, partly sunny, breezy, and warm, a high around 76 degrees. Saturday and Sunday, highs in the low 70s with a slight chance of rain both days and Monday. Mostly cloudy with rain and a high around 71 degrees. Coming up on the Metro, we'll discuss proposed toll rate changes for Detroiters at a recent Detroit Toll Rate Commission meeting. You all stay right there. The Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. And it's Friday, and our friends of the Detroit Documenters have returned, bringing us public meeting updates from across Detroit. We live in the Motor City, a car capital, of course, and with that also comes towing. 
I don't know about you all, but I've been told before, it's not a fun process. The Detroit police towed almost 31,000 cars last year. And the prices residents pay for police authorized tows are set by the Detroit Tow Rate Commission. Detroit documenters were at a commission meeting on September 12th, where they proposed a set of new rates that would they would be the first tow rate increases in over a decade. Wow. To discuss the proposal, we're joined by Bridge Detroit con- contributor and documenter Kaylee Lightlicker. Hi, Kaylee. Welcome to the Metro. Hi. Thank you for having me. And it's actually Kaylee Lick Lighter. Thank you so much, Kaylee. I always talk to you on social media, so it's really great to connect with you uh, via phone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also with us is Detroit Documenters Coordinator, Noah Kincaid. Noah, welcome back to the Metro. Hey, Tia. So great to be back. Always great to have you here. So, Noah, the documenter covering this meeting had an added challenge. What happened? Yeah, there was some misunderstandings. Um, We we went and covered, uh, we covered two of these meetings. And um, at the last one where they were actually going to present uh, or just discuss the rates they were going to present to city council, um, at, at the point they started getting into that conversation, they, uh, they kind of turned to the documenters and said, wait, you know, please, you can't share this with anybody, <gasps> which is, you know, in itself a misunderstanding of what we're there to do. That's yeah. exactly what we're there to do. Um, and then also, I think there was a misunderstanding about whether they were subject to the Open Meetings Act mm. um, and following, you know, uh, the rules of a public meeting, um, you know, to 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 that letter of the law Um, and I think they believed they were not and that was a misunderstanding as well. Okay so so why Noah why is the commission trying to raise the tow rates right now what are they proposing this is 10 years and and, you know yeah 11 actually since since the last time they raised it I think was uh, April of of 23 or I'm sorry of uh, 2013 Um, so they have to go through this process in order to raise the rates it's part of city code Uh, they're supposed to convene every two years um, and then they they kind of assess, OK, how much should these go up? Um, they put that together. Um, the the Tory Commission is kind of interesting, like how they're 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 a five member body that is um, comprised always of the auditor general, who is the chair. And then um, the chief of police or his representative or her representative, the um, uh, the head of B the director of B seed or their representative. And then um, two appointed members. One is supposed to represent the towing, um, the towing industry, and that's yeah. appointed by city council. The other one is appointed by the mayor, and they're supposed to represent the public. Um, but in this instance, um, the mayor actually appointed uh, Ike McKinnon, who's a former chief of police. So, I, you know, I don't was the public represented here? I, I don't know. I was going to say, it seems like a stacked uh, uh, lineup there. It seems like a stacked lineup of folk. Yeah. Well, you know, so they, they considered it over the course of from I think they met uh, starting in July, the end of July 25th or something. And then um, through the middle of September, they came up with their rates and um, and then they're, they've presented those to city council mm. and we're we're awaiting city council to make a decision on approving them or not. The discussion at this meeting was about changing rates that only apply to police authorized tows. How is a police authorized tow different from any other tow? So if you, um, let's say you're a private business and you have a private parking lot and somebody parks there who's not supposed to, um, you're just going to call a towing company and they're going to come tow that car. That's not a police authorized tow. Police authorized tows are like um, if they're going through and getting rid of, let's say, there's a boat that's been parked on your block for Mm -hmm. five years. (laughs) And and you call and say, look, this boat's been here forever. Will somebody come get it? That's a police authorized tow. If there's an accident and cars are disabled and they need to be towed, that's a police authorized tow. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for the distinction there. And if you are joining us, we're speaking with two different or two Detroit documenters about how toll rates and how they can change for Detroit residents really, really soon. So, Kaylee, you were at the city council meeting where the commission presented the new rates. What were some of the things that you were seeing? Um, well, so rates are expected to increase um, by about $100 for the standard vehicle, um, for boats and trailers and campers. Uh, those are going to increase from $100 to $700. Um and yeah. 
All right, so Kayla, we had this talk actually from Peggy Goodwin from the Detroit Towing Association. We got a little audio. And as a member of the Detroit Tow Rate Commission, she addressed city council during public comments period of the meeting. Here's that quote. I'm just very upset about this Tow Rate Commission. A $100 raise for the Tow Rate Commission is ridiculous for citizens to have to pay $100 more because the, co- the commission was not convening in the last 10 years. That's not the fault of the citizens. That's not the fault of anybody outside of city council. Police tolls are so egregious and they're taking people's cars there's a lot of people who are who have had their cars taken and it makes no sense also i will convene as many people as i can from the community i will organize as many people as i can to flood the next meeting if you vote on this and you pass this today you're never going to hear the end of it i'm going to talk about this for as long as i can I love that, actually. That was Dante. It seems like that was Dante Smith speaking at the meeting. He was not happy with the commission's tow rate increase at all from the city council. So, Noah, what's next for police authorized towing rates? Uh, City council is going to take it up. Um, They actually it was it was up for a vote on Tuesday. Um, Some council members still had questions that hadn't gotten answered, so they postponed it. Um, They're going to take it up again this Tuesday. Mm, Okay. And Kaylee, bringing you back into the conversation, you also you wrote uh, another story related to towing. There were some people paying tow fees who should not have been charged to begin with. How did that happen? Um, Well, so back in December of 2022, uh, the mayor and chief of police announced new towing reforms. Uh, One of those reforms was that the city was going to waive towing and storage fees for victims of auto theft. Um, And for Detroit, learned that residents were still being charged um, those fees. Uh, Residents were paying those fees. Um, And since then, now the uh, Detroit Police Department is offering refunds uh, to those residents who paid to recover to recover their stolen vehicle from a city, the city's impound yard. Mm-hmm. So I remember when you wrote that and I read that piece and I said, what is going on here? And so now after the piece come out, you said this is what's happening now. They were, they were, they're doing uh, refunds. Yeah. Uh, oh. Residents can uh, call the police towing and impound unit and request a refund if they were charged after January, 2023. Wow. That's actually really, really great to hear. So um, as we continue on the conversation, Noah, just want to talk a little bit more about um, the public comment section, the public meeting that was happening there with the tow rates. What were some of the other things that you were hearing from the folks who were in attendance, uh, especially those who were expressing concern about the, the increases? Yeah, well, I think Dante kind of <laughs> he, he kind of summed it up for everybody. Um, look, I mean. I mean, towing is an expensive process for anyone who's had to go through that. Um, And uh, a lot of people in Detroit uh, can barely afford their cars as it is. The car is expensive. The upkeep is expensive. Gasoline is expensive. Insurance, (laughs) registration. And so once you've done all of that to, to, um, you know, then you have it towed. I mean, there, there are a significant number of people who have lost their vehicles because they couldn't afford To pay the towing, you know, especially if they got towed for having a bunch of outstanding tickets, you typically have to pay all those outstanding tickets on top of the towing fees. So, you know, we're talking about a situation where potentially people are losing their only means of transportation. And in this city, like we know, there aren't a whole lot of other options outside of a car that will get you to your job and back on time. So, you know, it's it's something that's going to affect a lot of people. I mean, you talked 31,000 of these tows last year. Um and they really didn't start ramping up things up till I think around April. So mm-hmm. you know, potentially we'll have even more next year. Wow! 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 Noah, Ken, Cade, and Kaylee like. Lick Lighter. Uh, Join the show today. Detroit documenters talk about a recent tow meeting. I know that you all said that Tuesday we'll know more about it. So what do you expect? Do you, do you see it happening? Well, they're going to vote on it one way or the other yeah. because um, city code actually says they have to by o- October 1st. Okay. And Tuesday is October 1st, yeah. so it's it's their last chance to address it. All righty then, Noah. Thank you so much. Kaylee Licklider, thank you as well for joining us on the Metro. Thanks Absolutely. For, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for having us. That's the Metro for Friday, September 27th. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. The show is also on YouTube if you like listening that way. 
And the show is produced by Sam Corey, David Lyons, and Jack Phil. Brant, David, you look great in your Tigers gear today. Our engineer is Nate Bender. Music's done by Sam Bobian and Will Sessions. This is WDETFM Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Everyone, have a great weekend. Go Tigers. Thank you.